I found it fascinating how culture influences language, how language influences culture. Post editors, MT engineers, P consultants, here are the skills you need. Netflix reportedly spent half a billion dollars on original Korean programming in 2021 alone. And welcome everybody to another episode of Slater Pod. Hi there, Esther. Hi, Florian. So today's guest is Felix Laumann, the CEO of a startup in the natural language processing space. And yes. his startup is called Neural Space. So natural language in space, neural space. So he is, um, so neural space is a, a platform for low resource languages, a topic we've also discussed, but yes. I'll let Felix do the, the pitch, the nutshell introduction, et cetera. It's quite, uh, it's quite techy, of course. Uh, and they just raised uh, a round recently. So looking forward to talking to Felix. Uh, first, um, again, I really want to call people to action. Please go to clearglobal.org, donate, and uh, you know support their efforts in Ukraine and the border regions. So if you, if you go there, they, they will send teams to the borders to find out what the language and communication needs are of the people affected. They will do pro bono uh, translation for local orgs who are the first responders for people on the move. I mean, there's, uh, as far as I can read now from the BBC, there's like 2 million people already crossing or have crossed the border. Uh, so there's, there's so much activity going on at the border. So, you know, they will uh, clearly be able to translate into all relevant languages, key documents that help people, um, and conduct research and communication needs. So there's lots of kind of first, uh, things that yeah. need to get set up and, and they need, they need funds for that. This is, must be one of the biggest waves of refugees ever. Uh, and so. Very sad, but let's uh, let's try to support that via Clear Global from the language industry. I think it's a very um, valuable, of course, uh, initiative, and they they need the funds right now. I've also chatted with uh, Jan Hendricks from Beluga on LinkedIn. Uh, I meant to get back to him. They're they're setting up something uh, also with Lock Launcher. They're, they're looking at things from um, how they can support uh, uh, linguists that are are being affected. Right, businesses evaporating for you know Ukrainian uh, Russian languages, and um, and so they see how they maybe can potentially crush that blow, or at least kind of put the word out that maybe potential buyers could could uh, you know offer some work. And of course now there's uh, remote work available, so maybe some some linguists that uh, you know have seen their work disappear on the on the linguistic side, they they could potentially find work uh, elsewhere on the remote. We all know that. Translators and linguists are very clever, very smart people that can do other work as well. Highly adaptable. Yeah. Highly <laughs> adaptable. I mean, a lot of people here at Slater uh, have a, uh, originally a career in, in, in the language, well, on the production side of things as well. All right. So again, just head over to clearglobal.org slash donate and, uh, you know, do what you can. Uh, on our side, we have SlaterCon Remote coming up next week. Are you ready, Esther? Yes. I am emphatically not ready. I'm like, well, <laughs> if, if I'm not ready, I'm definitely looking forward to it. So how about that? That's right. Okay. okay. Good. You got, you got a couple of panels to manage and now I'm, I'm giving the presentation still, uh, as usual, uh, it's in a state of disarray and I need to put my slides together. So, uh, from the, we have the Australia leg of the conference. So that's where Anna is going to talk about some of the key trends. And then next up, we have Grant Straker from Straker Translations. Um, not on the pod, first on SlaterCon Remote. Looking forward to that. Then we have a media localization panel with head of localization of Astro uh, and of our CEO, Dion Wiggins from CTO of Omniscient. And then Andrew is going to moderate this from our side. Mm -hmm. uh, then telehealth. So Tia Dieterich, who we had on the pod uh, from 2M Language Services, she's going to uh, participate there together with Dieter from Boost Lingo and Yue Hu, uh, who is the director of Transcultural and Language Service and Narun Vilip Aboriginal Support Unit Northern Health. So that's going to be a very Aussie specific panel. It's basically two two complete conferences. It's two complete conferences. It's a mega conference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Crammed into one for our friends in Australia. Then we have Melanie uh, Hiwe. Uh, who's the manager product localization at Atlassian. And she's going to give a presentation on like enterprise log. Uh, then we have events and events, multilingual events panel with Interprofy, Simulin International, Encore Event Technologies Asia, and our good Andrew 
again. So he's going to be super, super busy. And then we're heading mm -hmm. into the next session. Again, I'll, I'll give the bullish case for the language industry. You, you're managing the transcreation panel or hosting yeah. the transcreation panel rather, right? Together with, uh, tell us a bit more about who's on the panel there. It's uh, Laura. Sorry, let me just uh, tell a bit more. So Laura from Supertext, Nina Sutler, Hovdar, uh, transcreation experts, Lindsay Hong from Lucaria, and Esther herself. And you, <laughs> yeah. transcreation. And then I'm qu quite pleased about um, uh, Cyril Dobrinsky, the CEO of Deluxe. Yeah. He's quite a new CEO as well, isn't he? Part, sort of two, two years, maybe? No? Two years, yeah. So, you know talking about streaming, how the landscape's evolving there, demand, et cetera. Very, very interesting. Uh, and then uh, there's going to be a break with Fidel Tech, where Andrew is uh, also managing that or hosting that. Then we got uh, Nick McMahon, ULG CEO, uh, doing a presentation, Salesforce AI, uh, Xiong Chiming, and then Elevation of the Localization Manager with Intento. We got Esri, Nike, Gap, and again, Andrew. And then Coursera, localization program manager, Nora Duong from Coursera, talking about e-learning localization at Coursera and how they measure localization success. So now you know everything that's going on at SlataCon Remote, and we're on minute six. So thank you so much for bearing with us, but don't miss this conference, all right? Today, we'll talk about Transline, Zoo Digital, Verbit briefly, and then post-editing skills. But... First, Transline, German LSP, um, quite large, and now they have a new owner. Tell us more about that. Yeah, they do. Uh, this is, I, I like writing about this, actually. It was quite an interesting one. Um, so we had uh, Transline in Germany, like you said, um, swapping private equity backers. Um, so Transline was already majority owned by a private equity firm, um, an Austrian firm called Lead Equities Group. Um, since 2014, so Lead Equities has sold um, their stake, um, its investment in, in Transline to a different investment firm, a German publicly traded investment firm called Blue Cap. Um, so this all happened um, on March the 4th. Um, so it's a 74% stake specifically that um, Blue Cap has, has taken over. Mm -hmm. Um, seventy-four percent stake in Transline, as well as the five uh, subsi subsidiaries of Transline, um, and Transline Group's founder and CEO, Dr. Wolfgang Sturz, he also has a, retains this significant minority stake um, of the remainder. Um, the operational management actually is intending to purchase a five percent, around a five percent stake, um, apparently from Blue Cap in the next few months. So they will also um, have... Must have yeah. skin in the game. Skin in the game. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Um, yeah. So Blue Cap, uh, they, they put out a press release announcing um, this, this acquisition as well and said that the purchase price for Transline, although not specifically disclosed uh, in numerical terms, they said it was in the lower third of the double digit million range. So that gives you some kind of indication. Um, of of the purchase price there um and interestingly i mean there's a lot of maybe not unsurprisingly I mean, there's a lot of focus on sort of talking about m a buy and build strategy um so Kat, we spoke to katia Schaber, who's the ceo of transline deutschland um and she was saying um blue cap's going to support transline obviously um both in terms of their organic growth and their acquisitive growth strategy which is still focused on on the DAC region. Um, that remains remains unchanged. Uh, Blue Cap itself is is heavily focused on on that region, um, and they you know have a particular interest in companies that work on production processes for and services relating to industrially manufactured goods. So it's this kind of heavy industry focus, which um, yeah you might expect from um, an investor in in that particular region. Um, but interestingly, then, you know, coming into the, the translation market for the first time via this um, acquisition of Transline, uh, Blue Cap's talking a little bit about the translation market, how they see things. Um, so they're saying, uh, you know, it's very fragmented and therefore um, it's subject to strong consolidation pressure, which they see as creating significant growth opportunities via buy and build. 
Uh, so Transline, you know, you can expect more um, M&A coming out of them as well. They've already done a little bit of um, M&A in, in, the, in the previous years. Um, and yeah, Shaber Katia said that she was, well, that Transline's already talking to a few different, you know, small and medium-sized translation service providers in the region. Um, and that we should expect more news to come out of it, uh, Transline, maybe even this year in 2022. So they're currently um, around 20 million, I think 20, 21 million euros. Um, so approximately 24 million US dollars. So actually, fun fact, they are the largest of the challenges in the language service provider index. Because oh, the really? threshold... Okay. Well, the threshold for qualifying as a leader is $25 million. So, you know, unfortunately... The euro, the euro to dollar exchange rate didn't quite allow uh, Transline to be qualified as an LSPI leader this year, but they're you know obviously in that in that ballpark, um, and they are the fourth largest um, LSP headquartered in Germany, so behind um, yeah other rivals Kern Apostroph T Works, um, and yeah had had a pretty good solid growth rate from 2020 of uh, more than 15 percent. So that's what's been happening at Transline. I find it interesting, Blue Cap, just the business model of that company, um, because they, they also have, they, they posted revenue. So, so they're publicly traded buying private companies. And then if you go to their website, their approach is, they say Blue Cap's approach, buy, transform, and sell. So, but it seemed like they, yeah, it's in a, but it seems like it's, I mean, it's not just the management company. It seems like they consolidated the, re, the, 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 re, the revenues of the companies they own into their, yeah, infra, like into their top line, in their top line, right? So yeah, yeah, they're like three hundred million euros. Top line, uh, blue cap is. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, actually, Transline is is not an insignificant part of that portfolio. It's not an insignificant part, mm. and I'm, I'm reading. Mm. So there's a fact sheet that says revenues were 175 million going to tw uh, 2018, up to 2019 was 225, then two, uh, 232, and EBITDA was like from 21, 15 to 34. Yeah, so it's it's not an insignificant part, but all yeah. right, like anybody who uh, they have a ton of information, of course, on the on the internets because they um, they're publicly listed. So head in there and uh, and read up on it. So next up is Media Lock. Yeah, tell us more. In Korea, not Germany, but Korea. Yeah, uh, well, in the UK. So Zoo Digital, publicly traded in the UK, um, this week announced that um, they have taken a majority share um, in a company based in Korea. Um, so Zoo Digital, they acquired a 51% stake in What Sub Pro. Um, and they simultaneously la launched uh, Zoo Korea. So they're basically using that as a platform to, to launch Zoo Korea. Um, you, might, you might remember they did something quite similar um, about six months ago when they launched Zoo Turkey. Uh, so Zoo also made a strategic investment in a company in Turkey called Aris Media um, about six months ago. And it seems to be sort of a pattern that they're developing now to kind of launch these international hubs in, in strategic locations so hang on so they're buying they're buying like their partners or vendors or like their in-country partners or vendors i mean i think it would depend on a case-by-case -case basis but i can't yeah. remember too much about ares but certainly what sub yeah. pro is a is a long-term partner of zoo so yeah they would have collaborated on on korean projects in the past for sure um so what sub pro now is yeah i mean focused on korean language uh, services that would include subtitling, dubbing, quality control, media services for uh, media entertainment customers. So for movies and dramas, documentaries um, and video games, apparently um, they work for some video game customers also. Um, but the logic here is for Zoo to gain, you know, in territory capacity um, for localization to and from Korean. Um, and I mean, Zoo obviously provided some analysis uh, or at least their take on the market for localiz media localization in Korea. They um, basically said, you know, Korean content is among the most watched in the world. And we all, we all know about Squid Game uh, and the success that that had recently. Um, but they're saying, you know, it goes, 
obviously goes beyond that. Um, and the idea here is to enable Zoo's customers to basically bring local language shows and movies to new global audiences. So coming out of Korea, um, but then also you know expanding the viewership in Korea for for non Korean original um, content also. Um, and they threw out some stats as well from um, some of the leading streaming providers. Um, so Zoo said in APAC. Um, Disney Plus has, al- has announced plans to create more than 50 Asia-Pacific original productions by 2023. Uh, and they only launched in the region, I guess, in 2021 because uh, Disney Plus was quite new. Um, mm. And then Netflix reportedly spent half a billion dollars on original Korean programming in 2021 alone. I mean, some of that will have gone on, <laughs> probably went on uh, on Squid Game itself. Um, but... Yeah, they've got a budget there for for developing um, Korean original programs as well. Uh, So, yeah, that's what Zoo's been up to in Korea. And then Verbit, touching briefly on that. So remember the multilingual transcription captioning company that raised like, I don't know, how much did they raise? Five and a million dollars? They raised two fifty um, in one round, but total total amount raised to date is five hundred and fifty million. Now they bought a company called Take Note. Yeah, I really like the company name. I was like, oh, it's a transcription provider and it's called Take Note. Take <laughs> Note, yes. Anyway, you should keep, keep the brand, <laughs> in my view. Maybe they rebrand into Take Note. So mm. that company, but it's not a, this is not a, a very large company, right? Because we did some digging and they yeah. don't, they don't have to post their full financials in the Take Note is UK headquartered, but they don't have they're not don't have a requirement to report um like full full accounts every year. So I mean there's a there's a number of reasons for exemption, but generally it means that you generate revenues of less than um ten million pounds. Okay. So so yeah, I mean thing is Verbit raised a ton of money to do M and A and that's what they're doing right now. And if yes. you're a transcription company, uh, you know, a giant exit route remains for you to sell to Verbit. Uh, doing some corporate development here for our friends at Verbit. Um, <laughs> very briefly, want to bring up an article people need to go and read um, about post editors, MT engineers, P consultants, here are the skills you need. So Maria uh, wrote an article uh, summarizing some of the research done by uh, Jean Nitzke, associate press at the University of Akter in Norway, and Sylvia hansen Shira, hmm. professor at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz. And they want to counter the point that um, kind of post-editing is like a tedious task and, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's um, yeah, uh, they want to counter that belief that it's not a very fulfilling task. They say post-editing is a complex task and a qualified post-editor needs very specific competency to be able to fulfill all the requirements of such a task. Of course, I agree. Mm-hmm. So we're highlighting three key profiles, the post editor, the MT yep. engineer, and the P consultant. Uh, and so the post editor, you know, they're uh, handling things like, um, well, of course they have to do error output handling. Like, you know, you read the output and then you handle the errors, you fix it, you maybe rewrite the, the odd segment. And so, of course, uh, post editors should be able to spot the errors in empty output. That's kind of the number one um, kind of challenge there. Then the empty engineer, more technology, technologically oriented, mainly responsible for selecting and training the most suitable MT system for a particular project or client, collecting and even creating the appropriate training data. We're going to speak to Felix about that later on. And then they evaluate also the uh, performance of MT systems. And the P consultant uh, involves kind of assessing project requirements, analyzing risks associated with using MT systems in the post-editing workflow and communicating with all the stakeholders. So post-editor, MT engineer, P consultant, and the article really talks about all of the key skills uh, that are required there. And it's based on really solid research from those two academics. So great write-up, Maria, and uh, encourage everybody to head over and read that. Now we'll head over and talk to Felix Lauman of Neuralspace about NLP. Sounds good. And welcome everybody to the second segment of the podcast today. We're super happy to have Felix Laumann join us today. So Felix is the CEO of Neuralspace, a natural language processing platform for low resource languages. Hey, Felix. Hey, Florian. Really nice to meet you. Also, Esther, very nice to meet you. Thanks for inviting me. 
Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining us indeed. So, Felix, uh, where does this podcast find you today? I'm based in London. I have been here since the beginning of the pandemic, basically. I'm still not stuck, but really enjoying, actually, uh, London. And, yeah, my team is spread out around the globe, most, most of them, at least. We have some people in Zurich, where you are based, Florian. We have some people in India. Uh, so, yeah, have have all of them. So, you haven't had an office yet, ever? or. No, we haven't had an office. A virtual office since day one. Any plans to ever have an office or like not really? Most, most likely, most yes. Likely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, India has some kind of uh, groups of people uh, where we want to open an office in London potentially in some, some time. Yeah, yeah. These two locations. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's fascinating that companies get started without office. Probably you haven't seen a couple of people that are on your team ever live in person, right? <laughs> totally, yes. <laughs> it's just crazy. So... Okay, so NLP, uh, it's not something we cover every day. It's super intriguing. And of course, it's uh, quite key to uh, kind of the engine of uh, what is what is already and what will be the language industry. So, but first, just give us a bit of your professional background. You studied, uh, you know, computer and me uh, science, and mechanical engineering. So how did you, I don't know, I, I wouldn't want to say end up, but how did you come across language tech and <laughs> NLP? What, what triggered that for you? Multiple very interesting aspects of language technology that, um, that were kind of ending up really that I ended up in that industry. Um, first, that is actually not an academic motivation at all, but I've been traveling around the world quite a bit. And I found it fascinating how culture influences language, how language influences culture. And then that like in, in, in Indonesia, I've been, for example, there are five different words for ocean, right? So we have one ocean, we have sea, it's the same. Um, say five different words, ocean and rain, ocean and wind, and so on, because it's so strongly influenced in their, in their daily life. And so I found that fascinating, first of all. And then um, when you just look at the alphabets, right, some, some of them, like look at locally, local Indian languages, Tamil, it's like art, right? Mm. Literally art for me, it's so beautiful. Um, when you go into Tibet, uh, the language is extremely beautiful when you just look at it, at the, at the alphabet and the letters. Um, so there are different, mm. different aspects that just motivate me as a person. But then when you go into um, kind of more taking my, my academic background into account, I find a very interesting mathematical models powering NLP technology. Um, so deep learning is obviously a term that everyone has heard about, but there's also lots of others which are more on a pure statistical level. And I actually have studied mathematics and statistics. Um, so I find it very fascinating when you can actually abstract from a world um, some numbers. So you represent them as a vector and then you can actually play around with these vectors and then in the end translate them again into words. Um, so that entire pipeline I found also very fascinating. It's great to hear about your sort of interest in, in specific languages and scripts and things like that. Um, and I mean, tell us a bit more about your company, about neuro, neural space. So what is it in a nutshell? Uh, yeah. What was the origin story to founding the company and, and what's your mission uh, with the company? So we were founded about three years ago now um, as really when we were at the end of our master. So um, my two co-founders are both from India originally, came over to Germany to study the master's in computer science with me. And then we got long really well and wanted to build something in the NLP space. Uh, in the beginning, obviously, we were not really sure and we didn't really know what's the best uh, to do, but we had always an extreme passion for low resource languages. And low resource languages is anything that's spoken basically in Asia and Africa, like local languages, right? And uh, we have been then also experimenting with the very early tools that were developed by Google, by Azure, Microsoft, and AWS, and so on. And we found quite quickly, and it's more or less the same now, is that they support only a few languages. And as soon as it goes into these low resource languages, the performance drops quite significantly. So um, when you just look at translation, um, machine translation, you have uh, for English to French, for English to German, probably really, really accurate translations, but then do whatever, Yoruba into French and every, sec every second word is, is wrong, right? So uh, it's really a massive challenge and we have been already been passionate about that. I think we can have a massive impact when we provide technology in these languages just to the everyday life of people, right? Like technology is all around us. If you kind of have that language barrier to use that technology, um, it's it's just a, a big burden for people. Yeah, and that's how we started. We then built a software developer toolkit, we call it now. Um, it's based on APIs. It's based, you can build everything in the command line interface. We also have a 
web interface that's completely no code with lots of dashboards and really nice to get an overview. Uh, but it's basically a collection of functionalities within the NLP space for low resource languages. So you mentioned low, that most or many low resource languages would be found in you know Africa, Asia, but I mean, is there another way to define what exactly is a low resource language is? How, how yeah. do you define it? When does a resource or when does a language no longer qualify as low yeah. resource? The pure academic and scientific definition is mm. just when it has a much smaller data set available. Right? So um, English has a massive amount of data. Our data comes eventually somewhere from the internet, right? Maybe you collect tweets, maybe you collect some translations of government uh, government documents. You can do that really well, for example, in Canada, when they publish everything in French and English, you have nearly perfect translations as the data that, and this is somewhere on the internet available. And yeah, we take English is just by nature, the language that is mostly represented or most, um, most uh, predominantly represented in the, uh, in the internet. And this is just a, like the top, right? And then. Mm. When we work on low resource languages, we often have 1% of the data available, or sometimes even less, 0.1%. And then it gets increasingly difficult because most of the state of the art models are built, built for English, right? GPT-3 was a brilliant example, um, and so on. That's all built in English, and then people try to adapt it to low resource languages. And this is quite difficult with so little amount of data available. What about synthetic data? Is that does that hold any promise or not like create it? Like there is a language with, you know, a decent size, but still low resource. And then you somehow create synthetic data to train models or is that not something yeah. you're looking at? It totally eligible approach and people have done it. We do it actually by ourselves as well. Um, it is, it is working. It, um, can be used at least at neural space to create semantically similar uh, data data than we already have, right? So for example, when you say in, let's say in Yoruba, you say, I would like um, to eat out tonight at restaurant X, Y, Z. Um, then we can create 10, 10 sentences, or at least at least 10, you can also do, create a hundred similar sentences that are another person is expressing it in, a, in Yoruba the same way, but it's still going to restaurant, right? So there is some value in what we can call like really original data just like how people interact, which then the machine can rarely replicate. It can, yeah, augment it, but not really get that original value that really human, human labeled or human, human data can have. So you recently raised a seed round. I think it was uh, $1.7 million. Now, two, two questions here. How did you connect with investors? And then maybe you, uh, you spoke to a few investors. Like, what was your, I don't know, 30 second pitch to them? How did you explain mm -hmm. to them what you're trying to build in like a shortest amount possible so they get it? Uh, so connecting to investors was um, luckily, I think in our position, luckily not that difficult. We went through an accelerator program by Techstars before. So they really facilitate the connection to investors. They by themselves, they also do now an additional investment in us. Um, but then I try just to like pitch as often as I can, right? There are different events that are organized in London. Online have now a couple uh, been, and now our lead investor actually comes from Silicon Valley mm. that we have never met in person. Um, but they have seen me pitching at one of these events, got in touch later, and then um, to them, it was quite an easy uh, pitch, I would say, because the actually the partner was working for Google research in the language uh, products. So it was, um, he knew the issue of low resource languages quite in detail. And that's also what I pitched in my 30 seconds I that we want to be the NLP provider for low resource languages. And we, at the moment, we believe we can uh, get that technology to people in the most efficient way through a developer toolkit. Uh, we may shift a bit of focus in, the, in a few years. We maybe then build more direct custom solutions. But at the moment, just like giving developers and there are like so many, especially in India, so many developers available. When you just give them the possibility to not, um, to not need to build the most complicated deep learning models to provide such a voice functionality, for example, or uh, another functionality in NLP, then they they are benefiting and they hopefully will use it. So that also brings me to a question I wanted to ask. So right now you have kind of an MVP. You're at that stage, minimal viable product. You launched this and now you're starting to get early yep. kind of commercial traction. So 
Is that correct? And then who are you getting commercial traction with and how do they know, find you and what are they building? Because I, I don't think, yeah. I mean, you probably would think you know what they're going to build, but are you surprised by what they're actually now starting to build on it or? By some, we are definitely surprised. So, so the, at the moment we write, we give 500 US dollars free of credit. So people are just signing up and, and then they get quite large allowance and can really build with it, um, whatever they want. Um, so customers that we target are a uh, chatbot or conversational AI development companies. And why we target specifically those is because we have seen kind of the landscape and there's really like, it's a big player. There's Google, which is always called Dialogflow, Azure yeah. with Louis and AWS with Lex or Comprehend. And uh, we provide this neural space with our language understanding app quite and a good alternative in my opinion. Um, just in terms of number of languages. So they have around 30 languages and we have 87. So nearly three times the amount of languages. That's already um, quite a good good approach. And we've also seen people like trying to get around that language constraint with first doing translation and then analysis in English, right? So you do, for example, Yoruba to English, then analysis in English. Um, but normally you get some, you lose some kind of information, right? So because translations are not that accurate and so on. So we do all of that natively in, in the 87 languages that we provide. And it gives, gives really, really good results in terms of performance and accuracy. Yeah, and how we get to know them. Um, our investors are a huge help. So they definitely make, make plenty of introductions. Uh, we work also uh, with some partners together who uh, find prospects for us. Um, we are all, all founders are part of communities. Um, maybe like Google developer circles. I'm here in London, part of uh, the machine learning meetup. I'm part of uh, Pi data and so on. So you get to know people, you get to speak to them and yeah, I hope we can, we can fill some of their pain points. And how do you decide which re, re sorry, I keep getting tripping over this word, low resource languages. How do you decide which ones to, to offer? Because there must be many more candidates than you're, are, you're able to yeah. work on. <laughs> totally. There are plenty and. Um, we have really defined so far 87, um, based on where can we have the potentially highest impact, right? So how many speakers are in that one language and, um, how, like, yeah, what, what does it take for us to acquire data for some, like sadly there is, for example, Wolof in Senegal, which we would love yeah. to offer. We don't at the moment because we can't find any data. We need to work like it really data needs to be collected for us. Either we do it by ourselves um, or we work with the data acquisition partner. I know some. I know some organisations in Senegal. It's funny you mentioned Wolof because my my mum lived there for two years, uh, so I visited a few times. It's really fascinating the the language and um, yeah everything that's on offer there. But <laughs> yeah, but but then we looked at like where where are most speakers and like just automatically you draw attention a bit on India, right? Because it's like one point three billion. Mm. Um, but then even in the, in India, we have now twelve languages. We also offer something which is um, called Hinglish or Banglish. So they mm -hmm. mix up Hindi and English, right? You've maybe seen that in the Arabic speaking world, it's called Arabisi. So they, they make mix up Arabic and English or Arabic and French sometimes. I think in, in African countries, maybe also, um, people used to speak that, that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's all something what we see, uh, huge traction on and people, people really like. And that's, I would assume also some kind of competitive advantage over the dialogue flows and AWSs of this world, right? Because you yeah. could, I mean, theoretically go to dialogue flow, but then if your language isn't there, then, well, what are you going to do? Uh, write an email to Google? Probably not. Yeah, so exactly. is that the key at this point in time, the key competitive advantage or do you, are you seeing other things that, that are really uh, differentiating you from, from those big tech solutions? the number of languages, definitely. And also then when dialogue flows, for example, offering Finnish, we have seen now recently being added, um, also the accuracy on that language, right? Because our, all our models are built with the sole purpose of fitting well to low resource languages. And I believe the big tech are more taking the opposite approach. They build something for English and then try to adapt it to the other languages. Mm. And we kind of take exactly the opposite approach um, and want to like low resource language first, English is in the end also there, but yeah, it's, um, it's the model is not meant to be the best one in English. 
just within within this framework and the focus on on NLP, um, I mean, does machine translation fit into the the framework and what you're focusing on um, in any yep. way, and how so? Definitely. So, machine translation is also one app or one feature on our platform. Yeah. Um, we have been using it in connection with others. So um, there's one brilliant example that, that we had uh, being designed by a customer, which was very interesting, is that they built the language understanding capabilities, which are in the end used by a chatbot in English, but then they also, so that none of their team members spoke a foreign language by themselves, or at least not the language that they want to cover. And then they used the translation feature to do what we call one to 100 chatbot. So you design in one language and then you apply it like to 100 languages. For us, it was something like 90 languages. Mm. But they did then like the translation of um, of, their, of their data with the machine translation app on our platform and then had it quite easily available to offer chatbots in many more languages. Tell us more about, let's say, India and chatbots. What, what are you seeing actual use cases being built? Like, is it like just e-commerce website, somebody asks something and you take the first kind of triage of what a person wants or what, what are some other use cases you're seeing being built? A, lo a lot, actually what, what we don't do in Europe, but what I call, or very rarely do, but what are um, WhatsApp chatbots. So you see that a lot that come, that really, you, I think I haven't seen it in Europe, but in India and other Asian countries, it's hugely popular. So you have uh, even a doctor, like a, a GP literally, offering a chatbot to, to book, uh, book an appointment, right? And maybe also do some basic symptoms checker because people are very often like mobile network is more or less like everywhere also in India, um, but then maybe not the strongest, right? So you can't, may maybe it's just not sufficient to go onto a website and then maybe the website's only in English and so on, right? So they offer very often a chatbot uh, for a business or for GP or something else. What we've also seen, which was actually a government project in India, it was not built with us, but, but, but one, one of our um, yeah, really close partners um, was offering a COVID vaccination booking systems through WhatsApp. So it was also a chatbot, and then they offered to yeah, book your COVID vaccination and you saw automatically the dates that are available and so on. And then you could have it booked through that. Is this, is this mostly text-based or can you also do voice to text and then people like interact using their voice because maybe there's some people that or some of these languages you can't even type or you can't type but people struggle typing. Yeah. These use cases that I mentioned, they were all purely text based. Uh, we want to get to the level of voice, right? There is um, like, actually I, I kind of dream of that uh, little merchants on the street in India um, have either a phone, so they most of them have a smartphone, which is very interesting, but then they can say, uh, please transfer five rupees to that and then that person, right? So would be ideal to get to that level where different dialects are understood and where then maybe in the beginning, little voice commands can actually be directly um, taken forward to do some actions. And that is in, like mostly in WhatsApp now. So you don't see any of the other chat apps or maybe Facebook chat, but yeah. There are, there are plenty of Facebook. I think it's, I don't see that much traction for WhatsApp, uh, not, not, not see that much traction on messengers and I see on, on WhatsApp. Uh, but people also use it like on their website, right? Very often in the right bottom, you see kind of a chatbot popping up, right? Um, I also know one other company that have done a lot on customer call centers. So they actually did first uh, like a voice, um, an artificial voice that is helping you with an FAQs. And then maybe you're forwarded to a real person if the issue is too complicated. Um, but yeah, even that voice command system can already handle a lot. And out of India, I mean, obviously the region of uh, that that everyone's looking at is is Ukraine at the moment. Is is that a language you currently offer? And are you seeing additional activity right now? Because I mean, I've never used machine translation in my life as much as I do right now when I machine translate tweets, right, with Google Translate. Are, are you seeing something there as well? We do offer the language. We don't have any projects at the moment being built on Neurospace in Ukraine. Uh, we would love to, obviously. Uh, I've been thinking about like what, what we could do, right? And um, there are even, um, so there are plenty of actually low resource languages in Ukraine as well. Um, I think people have something like 20, 20 regional languages. They are very often like dialects mm. or so, right? They're maybe not purely different languages, but it would be interesting, right? Like lots of people are maybe like stuck in the village at the moment, right? And then try to get some help. Got it. Let's talk about the, um, how you could go about collecting the data. So. How does that work? How do you, you know, let's say, Wolof, like if you decided to go there 
how would you go about this? Like you, you, you talk to somebody at the university, you go to a company, how do you source that kind of data if it's not freely available on the internet? Yeah. Um, so when at the moment we work mostly with data, data acquisition companies, so they have their own process, but we can mm. design these processes quite, uh, quite strongly. So what we want is everyday conversations, mostly conversations because they're valuable because we, like at the moment it's chatbot or voice, but right. It is always uh, really valuable, um, conversations, uh, where people really interact in the kitchen, in the extreme case, right? Like that's really where, where you get to know where, where nobody tries to speak a very good language or where nobody tries to like build proper sentences, like should really be everyday conversations. Uh, which are obviously like difficult to get, but we like, have our recording. Um, yeah, so our data acquisition company has some recording tools and as uh, they try to do that. Um, what we have been also thinking about, haven't done yet, is actually letting working directly with linguistic, uh, li yeah, linguistic professionals, and then let them read a certain text that covers different pronunciations and different emphasis and maybe even emotions, right? So. You can, for example, give the reader some instructions, please read that section in a very um, excited tone. Um, because we are also thinking of something which is called text to speech. So we actually want to um, produce some real speech output to some kind of text input, which is at the moment like a bit boring in my opinion, when you take the big tech provider. Mm. So it's like, hello, Florian, how are you today? Right? It's, 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 so, it's so neutral, it's so flat and neutral. So we would like to add some kind of spice to that, right? That's interesting. I mean, I mean, coming back to to neural space and, and your own team. Um, I mean, as we know, there's a lot of demand, so much demand for experienced developers um, in the areas of machine learning, deep learning, etc. In NLP. I mean, how how are you finding it? Kind of competing for talent um, in those areas. Um, how do you like what What's the pitch? What do you offer to to your kind of new or potential recruits? You're very right, Esther. It's, uh, it's a huge race and this kind of the uptake in remote work, um, right? Like American companies suddenly offer um, African employees, suddenly offer Indian employees a very, very high paid job, which we can't compete with. Uh, so it is it is tricky. Um, we have done yeah a couple of couple of decisions based on that mostly, and also like why we, why we believe that it's close to our value. So we offer every employee equity of the company. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter really on what level. If they directly come out of university, they will get equity. If they have 10 years of experience, they will have will get also equity. Uh, it's not always the same amount, but there is some kind of bond that we want to establish to the company. And it's obviously vesting over some period of time. Um, otherwise, we really have, it's, it's a lot about culture and that's also what people people like like working with us. So there's overall a quite flat hierarchy. Um, we do really like set learning as the number one criteria, what we, what we want to achieve all by ourselves. Um, so it's totally fine when you do mistakes, um, but you should like try to learn from that. And that's especially like, valuable for the ones, um, who, who just joined from university, right? Because they, like for, for them, it's a huge pressure in the first moment. And then we like always come and say, Hey, we are here to learn. We give you enough time um, and so on. You, and you can feel safe with us. We are not definitely not um, thinking we, that you directly need to produce. We always want to invest by ourselves as well. Uh, but it is it is tricky. Like we had um, yeah, bad experience that someone confirmed first that they joined and later on a week before they were supposed to join, they cancelled again. Mm. Uh, I think that can happen at the moment. Um, so people who, once they join, they normally stay very long because they really enjoy the work atmosphere. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a race at the moment. How mm -hmm. specialized are they or how, like when they join you, do they typically already have like a PhD in that field or is it still kind of it, it, their path would be wide open to go into any kind of kind of ML area or how specific would that profile already be? So far, we haven't hired anyone with a PhD. Two of our founders um, have PhDs so on, on the way to have a PhD. Um, and we generally try to like communicate and give that knowledge forward as much as we can. Um, we do see or we want that people have previous NLP experience. Right. Um, so even like if they have had like some kind of projects they need to have done in NLP. Um, 
because otherwise it's just extremely difficult to pick up. And like the pace of research is also very fast, right? So when you start kind of studying PhD, NLP, when you when you start working with us, I don't know if, if you will ever like catch up in the next four months, right? So you need to have some previous NLP experience. Um, when we, we also have hired platform engineers, right? Who are just like the pure experts in Microsoft Azure who know exactly how to scale and so on. Uh, but even them, we, even for them, we require some machine learning knowledge because like these models in the end need to scale to thousands of thousands of users. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's not not that easy also to find those people. Like the platform engineers are extremely in demand. I think just broader NLP space. Like what are some of the the cool things you're th you're thinking are coming out in the next two three years? What what are the most Kind of exciting research areas. You said research changes all the time. For us, it's later. It's super hard because we we never know. It's it's happening so quickly. What what do you see as kind of the the, the exciting areas? I find one particular um, idea that it actually depend on lots of smaller achievements. But I would like to have live to live voice translation yeah. or like voice to voice live translations, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something what I'm hugely fascinated about. There are companies, for example, in Rome translated. Um, who has done something in that direction, but I find that extremely, extremely fascinating because it also depends technologically on so many different levels, right? You need to have a nearly perfect speech to text, you need to have a nearly perfect translation, and then you need to have again, a nearly perfect, uh, text to speech. So you don't have like a lame and neutral language, a, ne a neutral voice. So you want to have like some excitement and so on. What is, um, what the original input was. So that would be fascinating if we can have that, um, maybe even like on, on what is called on edge, right? So without internet connection, mm. uh, that's like actually a different field, but I also find it quite fascinating where people try not to build so you, the largest language model that can possibly exist. They try to get very high performance on tiny models that can fit on a mobile device, can fit into a car computer and doesn't need to have internet connection to actually work, right? So what happens at the moment, when you when you use Siri on your phone, it directly goes to the web, right? It goes to a cloud, it's processed there because there's a massive language model behind, and then it goes back. So it's just your phone is just a kind of a transfer agent. Um, but if all the computation could be done on the mobile phone itself, I think it would be terrific. And like so open up so many use cases, right? Like data privacy con concerned customers uh, would be more happy to use it and so on. And what's on the roadmap for, for you and neural space in the next, you know, year to yeah. year and a half? So we are uh, not yet, not there yet to build such like speech to speech live translation, uh, but we really want to uh, build a neural space platform to cover nearly any fundamental NLP project or NLP mm -hmm. problem. And then our idea is, so we, we generally see the different apps on the neural space platform as building blocks, right? And they can combine, can be combined in different ways to build an end solution. Um, for us at the moment, we have um, our first language understanding app live on the platform. We want to add speech capabilities in Q2. So we have um, maybe not all 87, but maybe something like 40 to 50 languages for speech to text. Um, and then we also invest quite a bit in what's called auto NLP. So there's basically customization of some kind of, of these NLP functionalities for your data set. And we can already do that for language understanding, but for speech, also Google doesn't allow that at the moment. So um, we want that you can upload, if you go to our platform, you say, okay, I'm I'm saying now 10, whatever, 10 different words um, mm. with, my, with my voice and maybe about a topic that I find interesting. And then this entire model should adapt and should be kind of customized for you, right? Um, so that would also be uh, extremely fascinating. Yeah. And yeah, there's just these fundamental building blocks at the moment. And we later on think about what we call meta apps. So for example, that voice to voice translation. Meta apps. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. That was uh, illuminating. Uh, I, I love this space. I love this uh, NLP and we, we are glad to have you on. We learned a lot. Hope our listeners as well. Yeah, thanks, Felix. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye.